If you are interested in trying to improve the outcomes for youth who age out of foster care, then this podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Lynn Tanini, founder of Aging Out Institute, an organization dedicated to sharing resources and strategies that help youth who have to age out of the system be able to transition to independence successfully. Now grab something to take notes and get ready for some great information. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 1 of the Aging Out Institute podcast, Preparing Foster Youth for Adulting. Our guest today is my sister, Deborah Santiago. I thought it would be a fun way to kick off the podcast by having a conversation with my sister about our experience in foster care oh so many years ago. We haven't talked about our time in foster care for quite a long time, mostly because we just are living our own lives and it just hasn't come up. But I wanted to reminisce with her about our experience and talk a little bit about the challenges uh, for foster youth in achieving education, because that's one of the things that she and I were both able to do is to complete high school and college. So I thought that would be a good conversation for us today. Thanks so much for joining us. And now for our interview with my sister, Deborah Santiago. Hi, Deborah. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Well, I thought we would get started today with you sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do in life today. Well, I am married. I have two daughters, ages 20 and 17. My husband was also a foster kid, just as an aside. And I currently work uh, as an insurance agent with State Farm. Awesome. Yes. And just so our listeners know, you you and I actually do not live very far apart. We're about a half hour apart from each other in Pennsylvania. Yes. And we, we see each other quite often, which is nice. Yeah, it is. So I get to be part of uh, my niece's life growing up. and um, but, but the thing is, you and I have never really sat down and reminisced about our time in foster care. So I thought that this first podcast in this podcast series that AOI is launching, that you and I could sit down and think about our time in foster care and talk about some of the statistics, particularly around education. And, um, and you know, think about, based on our experiences, what we think could be done to help foster youth today. Sound good? Okay, absolutely. All right, great. So, Let's see. I thought we could focus um, not so much on what happened in our family before we ended up in foster care, but just start um, where we enter. Just suffice it to say that we were removed from our family for good reasons. And, uh, and we ended up first in North Carolina, that's where we were living at the time, in a group home. So what do you remember about that group home, Deborah? Well, I do remember that we had to change schools because it was in a different area than where we had been living. So that was something new, just having to kind of start the school year um, as the new kid. Although it was the beginning of the school year and it was 10th grade, which was the first grade in that high school. So there were a lot of new people. It wasn't like it was a huge big deal, but it was new for me because I didn't know anyone. Right, exactly. But I believe you were in ninth grade because we spent about a total of a year in group homes and then we were half a year with our grandmother so i think it was like mid 10th grade for me and mid 9th grade for you because again we haven't talked about this and then and then my entire senior year we were in pennsylvania right so there was a month or two where we stayed at the school that we were in they arranged for that and then the, the next fall we were still in the group home and we ended up going to to a different school right yeah, back to the group home. I don't want to jo- get too far ahead too fast. <laughs> I mean, I remember, I remember the the house parents who were very kind. Um, what were their names? It was, Clay- was, that, it was Clayton, Clayton and Pam. Yes, Clay- well, it was Clayton and Jill. No, Clayton no, and Pam. You're right. Clayton and Pam Whitehead. Oh, I don't remember their last name. I think it, I think it was Whitehead. I've tried to find them on Facebook, and I, I never could find them. And then there were the the substitute house parents which were um phil and jill staten now wait a minute so let's just let's just take a step back because there was the group home where we were there for a short period of time and then there was the emergency shelter and it was my my recollection that um jill and 
Phil were at the emergency shelter, not the group home. No, no. The, I actually don't remember the emergency shelter much. I know we were only there for a couple of weeks, and I don't remember that one very much. Okay, you might be right then. You might be right then. See, that's the great thing. Memory is just horrible, isn't it? You just you lose track of things. And and just so our listeners know, De- Deborah and I we're in our fifties, right? So, <laughs> so it's been a long time. So um, so yeah, you might be right. It was at the group home, and then the the emergency shelter. I think it was longer than a couple of weeks, but yeah, we weren't there terribly long. And then the yes, the group home had Clayton and Pam, and then the the fill-ins, the, the uh, substitutes were, the, uh, were Phil and Jill Staten. And I remember when we first right, got they were there, the relief, relief house relief parents. House parents. Yeah. Okay. When we first got there, we were the only ones there at the group home. And then there were some other kids that were brought in later. Because I remember we actually took a beach vacation with, Cl- with um, Clayton and Pam. Do you remember that? I do. We went to the beach. And we had never been, like, I didn't remember ever being at the beach before that, unless I was very, very small. So it was just the four of us. And it was like, like, kind of like a family. And it was just, it was very nice. It was very different from what we were used to. And, and it was very much appreciated at the time. And you know what? I think I might even have a picture from that vacation. I'm going to have to dig through my photographs. You know, this was before digital photographs. So I actually have physical pictures and I, I have one of Phil um, in a car, and I have one of Clayton laughing, and I don't remember if Pam is in the picture, but um, but I remember that I have that picture. So I should I should dig that out. Maybe I could even put it on the the website when uh, I post the podcast. So what do you remember about them? About the house parents, they were very kind. I think that um, Clayton and Pam were a little more strict. They had a whole point system set up of kind of reward and punishment uh, behavior that if you earn so many points, you know, then you got to play an extra hour on the Atari (laughs) or, you know, or maybe you could even earn money um, with the point system. Whereas if they took points away, then, you know, you were, that was your punishment for, for whatever it was. And I know that they were pretty strict on that. Um, Not that we were bad kids or lazy kids. It's just that, you know, you, you all, sometimes I felt very surprised at what they would take points away for. Um, but in general, they were funny and kind and, you know, they listened to us and uh, it was it was a good experience. And I think they were younger. And when I say younger, I mean, it, from the picture, I recall, I think they were either late 20s or maybe you know, early 30s, something like that. I would agree. I think I think both sets of house parents were, were about that age. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they, I remember having, you know, every time you did something, some kind of chore, something that you thought was either you were supposed to do or maybe a little above and beyond, you took that clipboard with the card for the point system and they had to approve it. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. I haven't thought about that in years, but yeah, you had to go to them all the time with your clipboard to make sure that you earned your points. There was a minimum number for the day. Uh, if I remember correctly, and then you had to earn that in order to get these privileges. I do remember that. You had to earn a minimum of 10,000 points a day. Oh my gosh, you remember how many points? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the points that were like, you know, 500 points for this, 2,000 points for that, so it wasn't difficult, but (laughs) yeah, it was 10,000 points per day. Right, and I mean, we were basically good kids, you know, we we did what we were told, you know, we, we, it didn't really have much of an issue with that. I know maybe, I think one of the, was that a co-ed group home? Did, was there a young man there at one point? Yes, there was. I have pictures of him. Yes. He had like dark curly hair. And he was a little more of a, maybe a behavior problem, but again, not horrible. (laughs) He struggled a little more. Yes. There was a young African-American girl there. And I remember she braided your hair. (laughs) <laughs> in these little tiny braids. And then there was a little, there was a really small little 10 year old girl. I think her name was Dawn, but I do remember that um, she had gone through some really difficult times. I think she might've been at the emergency shelter though, because she was waiting for a decision in the court system. Oh, I think she might've been at the emergency shelter. 
so that that's funny how you know we're, and i thought this might be fun for today to put together our different memories and kind of rebuild this this um story of of our time in foster care so we went to the group home we had house parents and relief house parents and the house parents were great i mean i think they were very caring i think they yeah. really cared about the kids and and helping us do well but then there was this relief house parent couple um pam um jill sorry jill and phil and they were also terrific, but they went a step beyond. And by the way, we didn't call them by their first names when we were little. Um, <laughs> now that we're adults, we're calling them by their first names. Um, but they went a step beyond. So what's your memory of what Phil and Jill did for us? First of all, Phil was hilarious. I remember he was so funny and he was really good with kids. Um, and they, they started taking us to church on Sundays with them. Um, they arranged it so that we would have meals with the pastor's family. And we got to, you know, be very close with the pastor's family, um, Jim and Iva Bird and their daughter, Wendy. It, it was, it, it was, they did, they did, they went above and beyond to, to help us and be with us. And I don't know if you know this, Lynn, um, I just found out about a year ago, I'm actually Facebook friends with Jill Staten. Oh, I am too. Yeah. So I don't know if you knew this, but she, I don't remember how the conversation started, but she said that she and Phil had started making plans with the court system to adopt us. Like, right, I didn't know that. Right before Uncle John showed up. Yep. Wow. I, I Did they ever mention it to us or was this no. just something they were thinking nope. about? They were Well, they had started making plans, but I don't think they were going to mention anything until it was decided. Like, I think they were going to ask us once they were approved. Mm -hmm. I don't think they wow. wanted to get our hopes up or anything. Wow. Well, that would have been a whole different life. It oh really would goodness. have been. And actually, the birds did the same thing. Jim mm -hmm. and I have a bird said as we like when the judge asked us and this is a little later in the story at one point um our uncle came <clears throat> and was going to go take us to live with our grandmother and it was like it was all decided okay here here he is he's taking you to live with your grandmother it's all done and i expressed and then after and then after that we went and lived with another foster home um because our, our grandmother was really not in a position to take good care of us physically or right you know, she was, and we'll talk know, about that yeah in a little so bit. Anyway, sometime during that process, I think between our grandmother and the other foster home, um, the, the judge had asked us, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go live with these people or do you want to stay here with the birds? Because the birds had said they had offered to take us in as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, we were popular, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but I mean, they were just very caring people and they, yeah. um, they I guess they were both willing to, to take us in. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's really nice to know that if the trajectory had not happened the way that it did, putting us with extended family, that we would have had homes to be in. Yes. Yeah. yeah and yes, wow. you're right. Our lives would have been very different. Very different. Wow. Well, well then let's, let's keep talking about it so people know what the trajectory was that we actually took. So we, sure. we were first in this group home and we built these relationships, but they moved us out of the group home because I believe that that group home was really designed more for behavior issue kids. So and you're talking about the emergency shelter or the group home? No, the group home. The emergency okay. shelter was a place where, where kids stayed when they were waiting for a decision in the court. Right. You know, and, and we were waiting for beds, year long beds to open up there. That's why right. we weren't placed right. there initially because they didn't have the beds. They didn't know how long we were going to be there. So right. they waited for two year long beds in the emergency shelter. And then we were in this group home that I think because, you know, they had that strict point system because they were working generally with kids that had more behavior issues like the right. young man that was there. Um, and so we weren't really the right kids for that type of home. So they moved us to this emergency shelter away from the people who we had built these relationships with, which in the system's eyes was the right thing to do because we weren't the right kids with, with behavior issues in that group home, but they didn't realize the relationships we had built there with the, with the house parents and the relief house parents. So we were, you know, we were kind of 
ripped away, if you will, from those people into the emergency shelter. And we were there for a while. But at that time, that's when our uncle, um, and that's that was the house, Deborah, where the, if I remember correctly, the heating system failed at Christmas time. I remember that Christmas. Yes. Yeah. So we were there. And I remember going on a couple of skating trips or something with the emergency shelter yes. kit. And so that emergency shelter, we were there for longer than just a couple of weeks, but that's the Christmas where we, did we go to a hotel or something? I think we, we did. did. We, yes. We, first of all, we went to Wendy's for dinner. I remember that for Christmas <laughs> dinner. And, <laughs> and then, yes, we went to a hotel that night. Um, all, and we all were allowed to bring like one Christmas present because that was all the Christmas presents were donated to this mm -hmm. emergency shelter. You know, yep. we didn't have family to, to give us Christmas presents. So these were, you know, donated Christmas gifts. I think we did give Christmas gifts to each other. Um, but we were allowed to take one thing to go to the hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, and I took the big giant candy cane. <laughs> You know, the one oh. that's like an inch across <laughs> um, to the hotel. And we watched um, The Sound of Music. And that's how we spent our Christmas. And I actually remember yeah. that as one of the best Christmases I've ever had, believe it or not. I actually think, and I, th I think you and I are remembering things backwards. Because what I remember is being in the emergency shelter first. We were brought there at like two in the morning. And again, we won't go into why, but we were brought there at two in the morning and we told our stories, you know, to police and social workers and all kinds of people. And then they, they took it two in the morning. They brought us to this emergency shelter and we were there for, I originally said a couple of weeks, but I actually think it was closer to a month or two. Mm -hmm. And then there was a court hearing. Um, and we ended up, then they moved us into what I called the group home. Mm -hmm. And that's where we had the people that we made the connections Yeah, you with. know, that would make more sense going into an emergency shelter first. So maybe we were waiting for the beds to open up at the group home right. rather than the emergency shelter. And we were at the group home for about eight months. Yeah, it was, it was a that. long time. It was a long time. And that, you know, maybe not quite eight because it was, it was basically the first it was like maybe July through mm -hmm. December, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So maybe six months. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, I'll, I'm going to stop and pause and just mention something here that, you know, I have, and I always have had a horrible memory and it's, you know, there's part of me that thinks that I kind of learned to forget things quickly almost because for example, we kept moving in the yeah. foster care system and you know it just was easier if you just forgot and then moved on and oh, i don't wow. i don't know if that's why i have a bad memory or if it's just something that is you know part of my brain makeup but i've always had a bad memory so i am absolutely open to your interpretation another reason i wanted to talk with you is your interpretation and your memories of this time together in foster care i figured you might remember more than me because my memories are more of i remember that it happened but i can't picture it that's, that's oh, okay. part of what i have in my memory the issue is i lose an image in my brain of what's happened in my life you know it's i know okay. the fact that it happened but those can get easily mixed up if you don't have the picture to back it up so oh wow um, so i did not know that about yeah you. yeah that's you know that's been something i've been dealing with my whole life but um yeah i don't Whereas think we've my ever... brain is more of I don't necessarily think I know that happened. I actually have a montage of pictures that pass into my head and they remind, like, I'll think of that, that picture will pass through my head. I'm like, oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's what happened mm -hmm. there. That's what that picture means. We need to, like, that's how my memories We work. need to get together more often. I've got the facts, <laughs> you've got the pictures. We'll work this out. We'll work this out. <laughs> all right. That's funny. Um, so, all right, moving on. So we were in the, let's say, we'll go back. We were emergency shelter first, then group home. And we moved from the, when we moved from the emergency shelter to the group home, did we, did we go to a different school altogether or did we stay in Hendersonville? I think we stayed. No, the emergency, yeah, the emergency shelter, we, they let us stay at Edneyville um, and, for the time that, until the end of that school year, because right. only like six weeks left to the end of the school and year. And then. Um, and then over the summer, they trans, while we were in the group home, we were at West Henderson. That's High. right. That's right. So we went to a different school at that point. And then um, 
then our uncle stepped in, like you said, and made arrangements for us to move in with our grandmother in Baltimore, Maryland. And, and that was super fast. I mean, that happened in two days, mm -hmm. like that we went from, because I don't, I think I've told you this story. I had made a good, good friend named Wendy at the West, Hender, West Henderson High. I mean, it had only been one semester, but we grew very close very quickly. Um, and <clears throat> we were told that we would, like, it was one day, or maybe it was a third, let's say it was a Thursday. And they were like, okay, you need to go to school Friday and pick up all your stuff and turn in your books. And then you're, you're going to your grandmother's in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, we, and we were told this at like eight o'clock at night. So I called, I called Wendy on the phone. I had enough points. <laughs> I was allowed to make a phone call. <laughs> and I called Wendy on the phone and I said, we're moving to Baltimore tomorrow. She got up at midnight. I do remember it was around midnight. She got up at midnight and baked a cake for me so that when I went to school the next day, she had this cake. I think I remember that. And then, and it was supposed to be a whole day. So I was, you know, just going to say goodbye to people at my classes, um, especially band, which as you know, was the, you know, as anytime I was a kid with problems, band was my safe place. Mm -hmm. Like that's where I was always accepted, always had a place to be, always made friends. Um, and so I was going to say goodbye to everybody in band, which was the last period of the day. Mm -hmm. But they called us in the middle of the day and said, it's, it's time to go. Yeah, that's right. And I, I passed a friend of mine <laughs> leaving the building. I passed a friend of mine. He's like, oh, where are you headed? And I'm like, Baltimore. <laughs> and we were in North Carolina. And so he's like, wait, what? <laughs> and I had to say, ask Wendy. And then I left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and we never saw those people again. Yeah. And, and that is, I'm going to guess that's not unusual at all for foster yeah. kids. I mean, I don't. Sure. I don't know for you know everybody, but it seems like this abrupt change right. would happen very, you know, common. It would be common. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it's really disrupting. And I think, you know, part of the reasons, again, I'm talking about myself is I, it's very easy for me to get to know people on a um, kind of a shallow level, just acquaintances, but I can meet I can meet people easily and I can become acquaintances with people very easily, but it's very tough for me to get close to somebody. And, and I think part of that is Even because, now? well, it's not as much now, of course, it's gotten better over the years, but definitely when I was younger. And I think part of that had to do with, I don't want to get close with people because I don't know when I'm going to have to leave because we went through several right. of these, um, you know, moving abruptly to a different place. So I think part of that was, from you know stemmed from foster care and mine was the opposite i had i was a cripplingly shy child mm -hmm. i mean even through high school I just shy doesn't even cover it uh, it was really really crippling and when i did make a friend when i was able to make a friend then they were it was very close it was a close friend i did not make like shallow acquaintances mm -hmm. kind of people mm -hmm. um so maybe, I don't know if it was harder, but, you know, when we would leave, for me, it was very difficult because I had, you know, I had made just a few people that I had met that I had, that I would get close, very, very close to um, in a relatively short period of time. But everyone else, just the general mob of people, I, I couldn't interact with. I, I did not have that skill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how we were such different people in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, okay. So back to our experiences. So we moved, we flew up to mm -hmm. Baltimore and we moved in with our grandmother who was, had to have been in her, was she in her seventies at that time? I think she was in her seventies at the time. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, she had agreed to take us in and the house was big enough. Of course there were, there were enough rooms. I think we each had our own room, didn't we? Yeah, she had a three bedroom house in Baltimore, yeah. which was, but I mean, she got it in the 30s or 40s. Right. So and she raised two children there. So, right. Yeah, so, um, and she had a boy and a girl. So I'm gathering they, that my mother and my uncle had their own rooms too. So, right. So that was about a semester, I'm going to say, our junior it was, year. It was like the last semester of my junior year, right? Because we went over yes, the and my 10th grade year. Yeah. So, yeah, my sophomore year. Yeah, so we were there about a semester. And, you know, again, I made 
several friends that I'm in fact in touch with them on Facebook, uh, several of the people there. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and the interesting thing there in Baltimore is in North Carolina, you know, we were in rural, rural North Carolina, primarily a white area. We move into Baltimore City <laughs> and we go to a school that was a public prep school and still is. It's called Baltimore City College. And it was a public prep school. And Baltimore City College High School. It, it was a high school. Yes. Yes, it was a high school. And the the majority of the um, the kids who attended there were African American. And we were in the minority. And the most of the people who were in the minority white population were Greek and or Jewish. <laughs> and so right. and I would I would say that we, you know, we were what white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, which made up maybe one percent of the school population. Yeah, yeah, and it was really. I mean, I I really liked my time there. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, I did too. And I'm sorry that it you know was so short, but I tell you what, having that experience in Baltimore, I mean, it just opened my eyes to you know the different cultures and different races and different everything, you know, with religious differences, race differences, and we were thrown in the mix. And for the first time in our life in the minority, and it right. was a huge learning experience for me. I'm so glad I had that experience. I had, <laughs> I was the only white kid in the band. And again, what's because I played saxophone. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I was pretty good at it. <laughs> Um, and I think you were the only white kid in the choir. I think you're right. And I know that the band kids made fun of me, like even the director, very kind, you know, lighthearted, fun, yes, but they poked, they poked fun at me because I couldn't do their, their rhythmic, mo like when they were doing a marching band, they did their wonderful, you know, city marching band moves that I just could not duplicate. <laughs> well, you um, know, it, <laughs> you, <laughs> I did not have rhythm, I guess. I, I don't say, know. No, it's just, you know, I some people might have been able to, but you, Deborah, do not have rhythm. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I, I enjoyed that very much. I also remember the very first day saying hello to people in a very strong Southern accent because we, you know, we had just spent seven years in North Carolina. And they were like, where are you from? Yep. Well, we had picked that up. We we so. had mimicked that and picked up that, that Southern accent. I think we lost yep. it fairly quickly, but we, we definitely had picked it up at that time. Right. But that was... And I yeah, remember we, you know, the school was only a couple, maybe three or four blocks away from my grandmother's house. So we walked mm -hmm. uh, to school mm -hmm. and it, it was a city school. So it ran on, on city buses. There were no school buses. So like school was never canceled for snow. It, it could have right. been two feet of snow out and they would still have school. So we, we would have to trudge through deep snow in the city to go mm -hmm. to, to go to school. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I, I enjoyed my time in um, at City College. I was in the choir. It was more like a jazz choir. And um, right. I really enjoyed that. And we also, um, I had become friends with the kids who played on the ultimate Frisbee team there that's right and so I got to practice with them sometimes and also they taught me how to throw which I still can do today so the ultimate frisbee throws so I was uh, that was a fun time but with with our grandmother I mean she was a dear and I'm I'm glad that she tried but she had her own challenges and she yes. drank um she would yes. nurse a a glass of wine one of those old-fashioned jelly jars that had like Flintstones on. Yeah, it that's right. That's right. And she would, <laughs> she would start drinking the wine out of a box at like nine, ten in the morning. Yeah, and and she also had those big jugs of wine too. She had some of those. I yeah. remember under her sink or something. But she would drink all day, but just little amounts all day. But by the evening, she would be definitely under the influence, and she'd get all emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And so she would get kind of weepy and emotional and it was, or angry every now and then she got angry. Yeah. Every now and then. And I think she did not like having us kind of intruding in her private life. She actually had a yeah. gentleman friend at the time who would visit and she, uh, not going into the details, but I think she just did not like having to 
she missed her privacy. She missed her privacy, and that was part of it. But she also had two teenage girls, and teenage girls know everything, right? We know everything at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and she did not, not like that we were um, kind of these, you know, kind of know-it-all teenagers. And at any rate, she decided she couldn't handle Right. having two teenagers and so she and to be honest it wasn't really fair to her to be i mean i don't know that i would want two teenage girls in my house in my 70s <laughs> you know that i would have sole responsibility for yeah them, so even though we were generally good kids um right we were it's a lot of work it is it is work i mean you got to cook more you got to you know put up with teenage girl stuff you know i'm sure we were emotional and it's expensive mm -hmm. i mean i'm sorry i'm a, i'm the mother of teenage girls now it's freaking expensive mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah you know as the as the teenagers at the time you don't think about that kind of thing mm -hmm. you know but and i and i think what it boils down to is we don't blame her for no not for at all. saying this isn't i can't do it you know so she basically right. i don't feel like she gave up on us i just think she had came to admit that this just wasn't going to be possible for her and right. um, at least emotionally or mentally and so our uncle again made arrangements for us to move into a different home and this home was I don't want to get too complicated but my uncle's wife right so my aunt our aunt's brother right my right. our aunt's brother was already um in the foster care system, he and his wife, um, Donald and Edna Sterner. And if I remember correctly, they, before we moved in, they would take babies in, in that were waiting for court decisions. And every now and then they would take care of a baby for a while. Is that what you remember? Yes, yeah. yes. And they took in, I know they took in over time, at least a dozen kids before us. Yeah. But they, I mean, they usually were. Not all at once, but yeah. <laughs> right, right. Not all at once. Yeah, so they had already been doing um, some foster work, foster care work, and so they they said they would take us in. So this was the summer before my senior year in high school and the summer before your junior year, and they took us in, and um, so that was kinship care, right? So our grandmother was kinship right. care. Sterners were kinship care. They were related, but we, I mean, they say we had met them, but I don't remember meeting them when we were little. Right. I, and I did. Yeah, we've had conversations as adults where they would talk about, yeah, we saw you when you were little and kids. And I don't remember yeah, that I at all. But, <laughs> but they knew who we were. Yeah, They certainly knew who we were. They knew who our family was. They knew the situation. Yeah. So. yeah. so it was really wonderful of them to open up their home. But we had to move from Baltimore, move out of yet another school mm -hmm. into a new school in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and so we moved in there and uh, I mean, long story short, I'm sure there's a lot we could talk about with the Sterners, but they are wonderful people. And they, uh, you know, enfolded us in their family. And it wasn't perfect, but it was great. And and I we're still part of their family. We still go to family right. reunions and um, holidays with them. And I feel like I'm an aunt to, you know, their grandchildren. Uh, it's just the age-wise. That's right. how it kind of worked out. And, um, and so I... I I thought it was wonderful. How about you? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And I, you know, in general, they certainly have treated us as family mm -hmm. and, and we are always welcome, you know, when we, when we go to holidays or reunions or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, so yes. Um, now I know this for you was your, just your senior year. Like you had to spend your senior year in a brand new school, mm -hmm. um, all new people and that I always I've thought of it since that it must have been more difficult I had at least two years at that high mm -hmm, school mm -hmm. and and made friends that again I'm still friends with on Facebook yeah. and and see you know once in a blue moon mm -hmm. um I don't have like you yeah I don't have any friends of my own from my class from that year I just right. I just don't think I bothered I don't think I bothered right. to, I you know I remember reading a lot I remember being by myself a lot I just don't think I bothered to become friends with anybody I'm sure I got along with a lot of people like I said but I just really didn't become close I became closer with your friends right then with because you you know you were friends with them and we got together on occasion and they were a couple friends that didn't live too far right from and of course they were all band people but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Band people are great. <laughs> um, well, that, like I said, that was no matter, you know, I went to what we went to event over the course of our lifetime. I think we went to eight different schools and I went to four different high schools. Mm -hmm. So when you're moving around that much for me anyway, having that 
you know, I'm in band, I play saxophone, you're, you're immediately part of a group. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is more, I think it's easier to, um, to become acclimated to the new school or the new people or whatever, when you have that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I sang, but I don't believe I joined a choir my senior year. I, I don't think I did. Um, I don't remember going to choir practices or anything. I think I was working and earning money okay. um, to go to college. And I think that's, you know, where I spent my extra time. And, uh, and that's an excellent segue. We should talk about college. <laughs> Well, we should, and we will. So let's do this. Okay. Tell you what, I, you know, I, I don't want this um, podcast to go over an hour. So let me go ahead oh, okay. and let's talk a little bit about high school, graduating from high school and graduating from college. So I'm going to give you some statistics that you may not be aware of. And that okay. is for high school first. There's a benchmark study by the Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative that a lot of listeners might recognize that showed that only 58% of foster youth actually earn a high school diploma by age 19. And that's compared with 87% of the national average uh, wow. of 87%. And another study by Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago followed foster youth through age 26. And they found that the percentage does increase over those seven years. So kids who leave might you know, quit school, might go back and get a GED, for example. So the percentage right. of those who have graduated high school or earned a GED by age 26 is 74%, up from 58, oh. but it's okay. still lower than the national average. So why do you think you and I were able to graduate from high school, even though we attended four <clears throat> different high schools and we were bouncing around in you know, group homes and kinship care? Why do you think we graduated when so many don't? Um, I think it was probably more than one reason. I think probably part of it was despite the problems that we had with our biological family when we were younger, <clears throat> uh, education was always emphasized. You know, our mother was a teacher, our grandmother was a teacher, our uncle was a professor, um, you know, and, and everyone in that family really valued education. Mm -hmm. And we were pushed we were actually, <laughs> I was, we were punished if we didn't get straight A's. That's, mm -hmm. that's how that worked. Mm -hmm. So in a way it was, it was just pounded into us that that's what you, that's just what you did. Kind of and literally. So, <laughs> literally, yes. <laughs> and we laugh about it now, but I mean, at the time it was, I mean, you're right. We, we did get punished and I don't want to, you know, make it sound like we got beaten all the time. It wasn't that, but no, but there was a lot of pressure to get straight A's. Yes. Yes. Um, so, and, and part of it too was I, in addition to that, because we were punished for bad grades and rewarded for good grades, I developed this whole, like my whole sense of self-worth was deeply rooted into the grades I got mm -hmm. and being the best in every class. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I would get upset with myself when I was in high school, I would get upset with myself if I didn't get the highest grade in the class of whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, because I felt like that, you know, I, again, it was all my part of my self-worth of who I was as a person. Like if, if I didn't get good grades, I wasn't worthwhile, basically. Um, so because of that pushing myself for that, I did end up graduating fourth in my my high school class of 300 and something. Yeah. Um, and it just seemed, <clears throat> it wasn't even a question that of course I was going to go to college um, at the time. Mm -hmm. And our foster, you know, Donald and Ender Sterner, the foster parents, all their kids went to college. And so they, you know, they were very supportive as far as, you know, helping us figure out where did we want to apply, taking us to college, at least for me, taking us to college visits, um, you know, I guess they must have paid application fees uh because i don't remember doing it <laughs> so you know they were supportive in our in our quest our desire to go to college so that that was another big part of it how about you yeah what do you think well it's, it's actually almost the same for me um, i also really pressured myself to get straight a's i did not push myself in high school as much as you did but i definitely wanted the a's i didn't yeah. feel like i had to have the highest grade but i definitely had to have an a so i graduated i I mean, I think I graduated with a 4.0. Um, I was not the valedictorian, but I, you know, I was up there. Um, right. But for me, it was more 
I don't know that I saw it as my as self worth, but for me, it was there's one thing in my life during this chaos that I can control. It's my grades, you know, for good or for bad as to how it was done, having the value of education drilled into us when we were little really helped us um, graduate from high school when the time came. And the Sterners continued that it was, it wasn't drilled into us at that point, but it was definitely um, encouraged. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So now talking about college, let me share some statistics with you on that. Um, research shows that only a small percentage of foster youth ever finish college and earn a bachelor's degree. Um, in fact, the percentage ranges from 2% to 11%, and that depends on which study you look at, right? The general percentage that's out there is 3%, but different studies have found different amounts. Wow. Um, so it just depends on which one you, you're reading. So the national average of how many kids actually graduate from college um, is who started at college is like 60%, right? So the percentage of, of foster youth who go to college and finish is so small. Uh, would you say the same reasons that we were talking about for high school apply for college and that's why we were able to finish college where so many don't? I think that was part of it. Um, for me, I was very aware of the money that was going into a loan and that I was gonna have to pay that back no matter what. <laughs> Because we, you know, we were, we did get some state mm -hmm. grants and, and federal grants because we were uh, wards of the state. We were, you know, we were in the system. So we did get some, call it help with call it financial aid with that. Um, and we got financial aid for, you know, our academic success. Um, I got some scholarships for my music success. But the, the bulk of the money was coming from federal loans. And so... I, as an independent student, knew that I personally was going to have to pay that money back. And I it, it didn't seem any point in leaving college if, if I was going to have to pay the back money, back the money anyway. <laughs> but yeah, there was still also that, you know, desire to to get the college degree and to to be like continue to be the best at what I was doing, I guess. The academic, yeah, the, the, that ingrained academic need to succeed. Right. And, and we had goals too. I mean, my goal at the time was to do something in psychology, right? I knew I wanted to do right. something there. I didn't have a specific job in mind, but I knew I wanted to get a career in psychology. And so, um, so I was driven to get that degree because I knew that degree would get me to that job. Did you have a goal that way? That's true because my, Yes, my initial goal was to be a music therapist. And isn't that interesting that we both chose fields that would be using therapy to help people when we ourselves were both foster kids? Yeah, I think that's common. I think that's common. A lot of foster kids go to college and become social workers. Yes, and shout out to the social workers that we dealt with over that time because they were amazing. Oh my gosh, Linda Couch in North Carolina. Do you remember her? I do. She had like one hand, I think. I think she did. I think she had an issue there with, with um, I don't know if it was an accident or what, but at any rate, I, I, I can't believe I remember her name. She was great. Yes. She was great. Now, once we were in kinship care, I think the social work support kind of went away because it's not the same. Uh, but yeah, Linda Couch was great. So I don't know if she's alive. I, I, I mean, I there's a possibility. So if she's out there, thank you. Thank you. If you're a social worker and social workers might listen to this. If you're a social worker, you don't know how you might be remembered and influence a young person. And she really helped with that transition into foster care and helping us understand the court process and everything. She was just great. She was. And it wasn't just that she was kind. She just she really made it her job to make sure we understood what was going on and what to expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back to college, I, I did initially want to go into music therapy. Um, and so that, that the major changed, but the desire to get the degree did not. So I ended up going into music education instead. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't end up going, I was going to be a school guide. when I was in college, I decided, oh, I'm going to be a school guidance counselor with hearing impaired children. And I actually decided to go to Gallaudet and learn sign language and, and do all of that. And it didn't work out that way. Um, it's not, it was just from choices. I'd made different choices eventually. Um, right. And I ended up going into corporate training and development, which I really enjoy. But um, 
at the time I was driven to, you know, get the degree that would get me the job. And uh, the money was part of it too. Um, you know, we were able to apply as independent students because we knew our parents wouldn't be putting us on their tax returns. So as dependents, so we were independent and that got us a lot of loans. Yeah. To, uh, to be able to attend. And now I know there is talk and there is already some um, states, there are some states that are allowing foster kids to attend state schools at no cost. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So there, there's, some, there's some movement along those lines to help young people get to college. And I'm assuming that might eventually mean trade schools too. Uh, but it, right. You know, right now it's college and community college, which is fantastic. That is fantastic. I, and I think that's a wonderful thing. I do. I mean, I, I think that once that occurs, of course, they still have to meet the requirements to be accepted into that college. Um, mm -hmm. But the fact that it's paid for as foster kids when they, you know, when you age out of the system, you have nothing. So mm -hmm. unless you've been working and saved up money, you know, you have nothing. So um, that's yeah. a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Yeah. And so many young people have to worry about just getting a job and putting a roof over their heads. Exactly. Much, much less going to college. Um, so if they don't have to pay for that, mm -hmm. then they can, you know, they can stay in the dorms. I know a lot of colleges are now um, in, they're starting programs where kids can stay in the foster kids can stay in the dorms over the summer and the breaks. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of forcing them. I know, I know I've heard of young people who are literally homeless during summer and breaks and they're attending oh, college. That's awful. Um, so it definitely happened. So we were very fortunate. I tell you what, one of the things that I say to people is that we were very fortunate in our experiences that we always had supportive adults. We had our uncle who was looking out for us and trying to make it work out. We had people who opened their homes to us, our grandmother and then the Sterners. And so we were just very, very fortunate that even though we came from an environment that I know is not as bad as many. I know there are a lot of kids out there that had uh, family life oh. and have family lives that are much worse than what we had. Yeah. But um, but we we were very fortunate in in the direction of of how things went, and so I just you know I'm very grateful. Me too. Wow, isn't gratitude a good way to end a podcast like this? <laughs> it really <laughs> is. <laughs> so. So, you know, I, I think this is probably a good time. There's, and we could talk about so much more, but we're coming up on 50 minutes here and I don't want to have it go too long. So Deborah, thank you so much for talking with me about our experience in foster care. I knew coming together, like I said, with our memories, we'd be able to piece it together again. And, uh, and I'm glad that I went through foster care with you because if I had been by myself, it would have been so much harder. So I just want to, you know, thank you too for, even though you didn't have a choice in the matter, being with me <laughs> through those years <laughs> and, uh, and being my best friend, really. And I, I've, I've said that to you before too, that, you know, I think we both very much appreciate the fact that we were kept together um, as sisters and were able to stay together during the whole process. Because I know there are so many families that are, you know, siblings that are separated. We were not. That was wonderful. And you, you were absolutely right. We were each other's best friend through it. So, yep. Yep. And that's, you know, that's another topic for another day too. the whole sibling thing. Yeah. You made me tear up. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Deborah, for being part of this. I really appreciate it. Um, for the listeners, you're going to be able to find links to the resources, programs, or research that are mentioned during the podcast on the AOI podcast webpage at agingoutinstitute.org forward slash AOI podcast. If you have any suggestions for people or programs that you think we should highlight in a future podcast, please send an email with your ideas to podcast at agingoutinstitute.org. So thank you all so much for listening to our new podcast, Preparing Foster Youth for Adulting. And we'd like to give a shout out to G. Cooper, one of the AOI followers on Twitter who gave us the idea for this podcast name. 